Implications The United States and other countries that levied sanctions against Russia for its war on Ukraine have deployed an impressive array of financial weapons. These include disconnecting Russian banks from SWIFT, barring banks from engaging in most transactions with Russian counterparties, whether through chips or another Western clearinghouse, and freezing the foreign reserves of Russia's central bank. These steps are possible because SWIFT, in which Western banks are important shareholders, is incorporated in Belgium and because CHIPS is supervised by the U.S. government, just as clearinghouses in other countries are supervised by their national authorities. They are possible since the dollar is the dominant international currency, because it is used by CHIPS, because it is used disproportionately to invoice and settle cross-border transactions globally and because it accounts for the majority of global foreign exchange reserves. This has left Russia scrambling for other ways to execute cross-border transactions, both when receiving payment for its oil exports and when making payment for merchandise imports. It is looking for forms other than dollars, euros, pounds, and yen in which to hold its foreign reserves and for places other than the United States. Euro area, the United Kingdom, and Japan to hold them. Given the costs incurred by Russia as a result of these sanctions, other governments contemplating possible conflict with the United States and its allies are presumably asking whether they can build institutions and identify arrangements that liberate them from SWIFT, CHIPS, and the dollar. China is an obvious candidate for moving in this direction. Given its goal of reunification with Taiwan, it has reason to contemplate the possibility of geopolitical conflict with the United States, which is committed to defending the island's autonomy. It has the economic and financial size required to build alternative financial arrangements. It is the world's largest exporter by value and second only to the United States in the value of its imports. The renminbi is a natural habitat for its exporting and importing firms. China is the number one source of foreign direct investment, FDI, and just a hair behind the United States as an FDI destination. Chinese authorities are encouraging foreign importers to make payment in renminbi and recipients of belt and road loans to borrow in the currency. It has built SIPs to facilitate transactions. These alternatives will appeal to countries worried about being targeted by U.S. sanctions. They are aware that the United States and China could be on opposite sides of a future geopolitical conflict or, if the conflict does not involve China directly, that its government may prefer to stay neutral. Doing business through Chinese financial institutions would thus be a way to circumvent U.S. sanctions. This would be convenient since China already constitutes a major market. China was already the leading destination for Russian exports, for example, even before the Ukrainian invasion. Doing business through Chinese financial institutions and accumulating earnings in the form of renminbi is attractive insofar as the currency can be used for purchases of merchandise and materiel from China. To pay Chinese construction companies, and to invest in Chinese government bonds. In the extreme scenario where relations between the United States and China break down, two self contained monetary and financial systems might emerge a Western system centered on the United States and utilizing the dollar, and an Eastern system centered on China and utilizing the renminbi. In a less extreme scenario where there are no U.S. sanctions on China, or vice versa, and no outright military conflict between the two countries, there will be overlap. Western financial institutions will use the renminbi and SIPs for some transactions with their Chinese counterparts, and Chinese financial institutions will use CHIPS. Their respective national authorities have not opposed this in the past. The four big public Chinese banks are direct participants in CHIPS, while Citi is reportedly a direct participant in SIPS. To be sure, if the United States saw China as facilitating Russia's evasion of sanctions, this permissive stance could change. 
Having Washington bar U.S. banks from participating in SIPs would be a further blow to U.S.-Chinese relations and accelerate the country's economic and financial decoupling. This would have far-reaching implications not just for the financial system but also for the fundamental organization of the respective economies. Short of that, however, the two cross-border financial systems will continue to overlap. Most observers, when referring to U.S.-China decoupling, foresee slower growth or stagnation of bilateral trade and investment flows. Not that such flows will cease entirely. They anticipate limits on imports and exports of strategic goods and technologies, as well as policy measures designed to heighten the two countries' self-sufficiency in strategic areas. It is conceivable, of course that they are underestimating the extent of prospective decoupling. If something halted bilateral trade and investment flows entirely, however, the reorganization of cross-border clearing would be the least of anyone's problems. More immediately, China's financial arrangements, such as SIPs, could weaken the effect of Western sanctions by offering targeted countries a hard-to-detect workaround. But CHIPS processes 40 times as many transactions for 10 times as many banks. China's financial messaging system is used by only a handful of direct participants, and SIPS continues to rely on SWIFT for most of its transactions. The renminbi, in which additional cross-border transactions will be denominated if and when payments migrate to SIPS, accounts for just 2.1% of transactions currently supported by SWIFT. SIPs would provide some solace for a country barred from CHIPS, but it would not allow that country and its banks to replicate the entire previous network of transactions. How soon could China's alternative arrangements constitute an actual threat to the effectiveness of Western sanctions? If we take at face value Chinese press reports that the volume of transactions through SIPs is growing by 50% per year, then SIPs could perhaps match the volume of transactions conducted through CHIPS and have a comparable number of participating banks within a decade. However, the expansion of a new payment platform is apt to slow as it grows. Moreover, it took three full years, from February 2019 to February 2022. For the share of messages on SWIFT pertaining to transactions in renminbi, as weighted by the value of transactions, to rise from 1.9 to just 2.1% of the total. If we extrapolate this rate of growth, one-tenth of 1% per annum, indefinitely into the future, then it will be many. Many years before China and the renminbi begin to rival the United States and the dollar in the payment sphere. The eventual outcome, the time required before the renminbi matches the dollar as a payments currency, will likely lie somewhere between these lower and upper bounds. Thus, countries like the United States that rely on financial sanctions should ponder and prepare for the development of alternative financial arrangements in China and elsewhere. This may mean broadening the coalition of countries acting together to apply and enforce sanctions while encouraging domestic financial institutions to continue to work through Western clearinghouses. It may mean relying more on non-financial sanctions and devising new non-financial instruments, insofar as financial sanctions become less successful. But the time when these alternative financial arrangements render Western financial sanctions ineffective is still a considerable distance away. There exist other, more immediate threats to the efficacy of deterrence and to geopolitical stability more generally. That's all for now. Thank you for your interest.